Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Having navigated the heterogeneous landscape of emerging markets, I would like to welcome Professor Jose Manuel Gonzalez Paramo, who is uh, the executive president of uh, executive board director of BBVA, with a rich experience also in some emerging markets, and we would like to draw on your experience as well. Warm welcome. Let me first uh, thank, uh, thank you, the organization for inviting me here. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to, to be back to Frankfurt and to, to speak about this very important uh, topic. Uh, I think uh, th there will be a common thread running through the two introductory speeches, so there's a number of topics that I would not elaborate uh, a lot after the, the one we heard by, by Richard Holmes. But indeed, uh, a very salient feature of the uh, uh, last crisis has been that emerging countries, instead of adding to the problems, have uh, been part of the solution because they have kept very healthy growth rates in a moment when the develop, developed world was suffering a lot. Uh, and the, 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 the facts uh, speak for themselves. A number of them have been mentioned before. But you see, over the last uh, 15 years, the uh, emerging world has been growing at an average uh, rate of 6% nothing less than 6%, which is pretty healthy, and this uh, permitted the world to grow on average at 3.9, because developed, the developed world uh, grew only 1.8%, and we are capturing here also the recovery. So, uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity when you look into, into uh, these average uh, figures. For instance, Asia has been leading the pack, clearly with a rate of growth of 8% over these 15 years, since 2000. Uh, the uh, um, emerging and developing Europe has been growing at 4%, and uh, Latin America and the Caribbean around 3%. But all in all, this is a uh, very good news. There are also differences in the way growth has impacted on uh, poverty and inequality. So you can see in Asia, for instance, uh, the growth has been very much pro-poor, uh, in Latin America, you see more inclusiveness in the sense that you're seeing poverty going down, but also inequality, which is, which is a good thing. Um, several factors have uh, underpinned this extraordinary uh, period of growth, and again, some of them have been mentioned. I would say, first of all, there is the catching up process, or let's say the resumption of the catching up process after the uh, debt crisis of the 90s. That is indeed very true. So after the uh, companies and the banks cleaned up balance sheets, then the, the catching up process restarted again with full strength. Second is the external tailwinds. So they have uh, obtained help also from the inclusion of China in uh, a globalized world and very low interest rates uh, in, in uh, developed uh, countries. And those have uh, triggered all kinds of uh, favorable spillover effects in terms of uh, energy exports, for instance, for those countries exporting energy, uh, capital flows coming into emerging markets and so on. And I would say the third factor behind this has to do with policy, uh, with policy institutions and with policy reforms. And this was also mentioned before. So in a way, they're very complementary. So you see in many of the emerging countries, uh, most of them have been set up uh, uh, strong institutions in the fiscal domain, so you see many countries where there are fiscal rules in place. Uh, you see independent and credible central banks in many of the emerging countries, and uh, you also see uh, uh, supervision which conforms to, to our standards. And as a consequence of this, many have adopted flexible exchange rates, uh, many have inflation targeting regimes, monetary and fiscal policies have shown to be, by and large, uh, prudent, and debt, both uh, public and private debt, uh, stands at manageable levels. This, taken together, explains the resilience of the emerging world. Now, of course, we are facing important challenges. So the question is, are we bound to continue to count on the emerging economies uh, for the times to come? And the, uh, the, there is a very challenging environment ahead. Uh, so we have to be 
very much focusing on, on, on the main elements, because first of all, growth of China, and this is a structural element. Growth of China is both rebalancing in composition, but also diminishing uh, on the back of uh, lower population growth and lower uh, labor uh, force growth. Of course, growth is healthier in China. This is having uh, spillover effects in the area surrounding China, and it's also impacting imports of uh, uh, commodities, and in particular, uh, energy inputs. So those countries that specialized in exporting those are suffering the most from this rebalancing uh, of China. Second, uh, I will mention the uh, variable speed recovery in the developed world. You, we see the U.S. growing at uh, healthy uh, growth rates and uh, about to abandon this very uh, ultra-lax monetary policy, about to exit the zero uh, rate uh, era whilst uh, Europe, or uh, to, to be more rigorous, the Eurozone and, and, and Japan are um, promising low rates still for long. So these diverging uh, cycles of monetary policy are, uh, is, is, is having an impact in, in, in the uh, emerging uh, world. Uh, for good reasons, Europe is doing what it is doing, uh, because the disanchoring of inflation expectations caused the ECB to do what, uh, what it does. But the fact is that some Capital inflows that were so favorable for growth in these countries are now reversing, or at least the speed is, is, is coming down. There is a lot of volatility in some asset prices, and this is, of course, impacting the prospects uh, for growth uh, in, 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 this, in these economies. Um, so going forward, we should expect lower inflows on average uh, for these countries possibly currency depreciation, in particular for those currencies more reflected in uh, emerging market indices. On the positive side, of course, uh, monetary policy has been, for the most part, already priced in. But we will see, we are seeing at the moment, uh, some volatility. And finally, the last challenge I think emerging market economies are facing is the, uh, uh, the uh, so-called middle income trap we see some exhaustion in the increase of uh, factors of production, labor and capital, and at the same time, total factor productivity is, uh, uh, in a way, growth is, is, is waning. Uh, so for, for the last year we have data, the growth rate is almost zero, 0.2%. And this should be a matter uh, uh, of um, preoccupation for the authorities in charge of taking measures. So to sum up, uh, the end of the external tailwinds and the structural problems suggest that something must be done to overcome the, uh, the challenges uh, ahead, not just of economic nature, but also of uh, a social nature. We have seen for a long period increases in per capita growth, uh, but at the moment when growth rates are diminishing, we could see bouts of unrest, you know, the contrast between what they see via the social media and what they get could be uh, significant, uh, thus triggering perhaps uh, bouts of instability and populism. So um, with, with this in mind, what could be the uh, reforms or institutional changes that could be introduced uh, in order to, to minimize the effect of this less favorable environment? And I would mention four of them. First of all, I would say the, uh, to, to address the very short term uh, mm, challenges, uh, you have first macroprudential policy at hand, so developing macroprudential frameworks in order to address, among other things, the instability uh, connected to the reversal of capital flows could be uh, um, uh, an issue. And second, of course, fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, some very prominent policy makers in emerging countries, and I'm thinking of Agustin Carstens of Mexico, they say this is the first line of defense. Having a healthy public sector accounts uh, uh, defends you a lot. And if you don't have room for maneuver, you should create it, especially in, in those countries where uh, the uh, uh, tax revenues are not uh, sufficiently uh, high to provide some room for maneuver to fiscal policy. So increasing revenues uh, is an urgent matter for some countries, uh, and this is especially so, in my view, in Asia. If you have to manage aggregate demand and at the same time finance 
productivity enhancing expenditure, there is no other way than having the right level of, of revenue. So eliminating tax exemptions, fighting informality, and this is quite a challenge in many of these countries, fighting informality, especially, I would say, Latin America, this is a big, a big issue. Uh, gradual fiscal consolidation, ending uh, with uh, uh, subsidies, uh, uh, are issues that should be at least considered on the agenda. Thirdly, I would say trade. And, and let me change hats now. Uh, from BBVA hat, and I, pu I put on my hat as a European chair of the Transatlantic Business Dialogue. I am one of those that are trying to push gently our politicians to agree with uh, our American colleagues on a decent TTIP, because TTIP would be good, of course, for Europe, good for the US, and the figures have been mentioned, but also indirectly good for all those that we are trading with. Uh, and on top of it, this could help to uh, for th these countries to react as they are doing. For instance, the uh, Pacific Alliance, as you know, in Latin America, there is a set of, so to speak, good countries with good institution, democracy, open markets, which are Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile. And they have uh, formed the Pacific Alliance, which is a free trade area in vocation that could go deeper. There is a treaty being negotiated with the Pacific countries, the US and the Pacific countries. The Mexico is renegotiating a treaty with the European Union and so on and so forth. I think fostering trade and making these economies better integrated in the global value chain uh, should become a policy priority in my view. And finally, of course, reforms. Reforms, this is a term that applies to Europe and the developed world, but also to developing countries. Of course, those reforms are different from the ones we are calling for here. Um, those reforms should help to restore growth potential by unlocking productivity growth. And which kind of reforms we should think of? Of course, basic education, infrastructure investment in order to remove bottlenecks, think of transport, think of electricity and power supply. Um, an additional type of reform should have to do with the quality of institutions. There has been a huge improvement, but there is a lot that remains to to be done to reinforce institutions, rule of law, for instance. Um, in addition to that, improving or increasing the flexibility in both labor and product markets uh, should be a priority in order to reduce the structural unemployment, fostering innovation and R&D is an additional avenue. And finally, let me mention the financial sector because the financial sector is a cornerstone, not just for keeping growth at uh, the high rates we have seen, but also an instrument to reduce poverty because this is linked to inclusion. Financial inclusion is one additional tool in the way to reduce poverty. And this is why financial inclusion is more and more at the top of the agenda in the international discussions, including the G20. And the G20 has now in place a task force dealing with financial inclusion. Financial inclusion then should be uh, very high also on the agenda of this emerging countries going forward. So there is still plenty of room for convergence, I think, and the margin for improvements in uh, infrastructure, human capital, labor and productivity, uh, product market reforms and adapting institution is still significant. I think the, the engine of the emerging market, uh, uh, markets is still functioning, uh, but now we cannot go on autopilot because there is uh, something more to be done on our side with, of course, the help of those that trade with them or that share in common uh, uh, interests. Uh, economic and social reform uh, has facilitated in the past a long period of wealth creation and stability. And now I think there are plenty of opportunities to restore uh, potential uh, growth potential if they push you uh, this new agenda. And the reverse is also true. The opportunity cost of doing nothing is so high that uh, it should be clear that complacency is not an option today for these countries. Thank you very much.